communicate with any drugs or alcohol? Are you sexually active? I don't You had us worried last night, 12.15. It's not what we agreed to. Yeah, that wasn't my fault. Actually, sister was late to pick us up. Oh. And I'm telling you, you know, being in an individual that did not have a drug and alcohol problem, I didn't identify it until the very end. And I think we would have lost her if she wouldn't have gotten the help that she got. Hannah, you're not here to be punished, and you're not here to be shamed. The important thing is, what can you learn from this? He asked me if the talent in the movie, like, as an example, Peter Coyote, what, what did he bring to the party? Peter Coyote's um, daughter was a an addict. And of course, you guys know Peter lives in, I think he lives in Marin County. Mill Valley, okay. So, when, I think I think every actor who chooses to be involved in an independent movie does it for a purpose. And he asked me the question, you know, what did he bring to the party? It's, you don't tell Peter how to act. <laughs> Peter knew exactly what to do. And a lot of the words he modified in order to make them his own. a job for you. Is it illegal? You understand the importance of this undertaking, Bob. It's personal. What favor, Bob? If anything were to go wrong, uh, I would spend the rest of my life in prison. I mean, how could you even possibly contemplate doing something illegal after all of the work you've done? I'm looking for a girl. There is absolutely zero chance you would ever make it back to civilization on your own. No closer. You took what is mine. Oh my god. If you get caught, don't call me this time. I have a friend of mine in a, a, a one of my producers of another pro, uh, show that I'm working on. Um. It's very hard for wealthy people or famous people to get sober uh, because they never hit bottom. Somebody's always holding them up or telling them they're great, uh, and uh, it's terrible. Anyway, moving right along, we'll get, we'll get back to all that. You have quite a bit of time in the program, huh? Yeah. I am, I'm a person in long-term recovery, mm -hmm. and what that means for me is that in October of 1986, I stopped using drugs and alcohol as a way to fix my feelings. and. Uh, I was a, a student, actually, at uh, Chico State and uh, didn't really fully understand what was wrong with me, but I definitely knew something was wrong with me. I wasn't, I didn't have a, a normal relationship with alcohol um, and I had a lot of problems. And so I was blessed with that moment of clarity that we get when we are able to get clean and sober. So. No, Lindsay Lohan. Lindsay I'm Lohan. Sorry. Oh yeah, my God. Lindsay Lohan. That poor thing. I had contacted her people, let them know that I was available. Yeah. We, yeah we've got it handled. And 10 years later, yeah, she's a see, see that she's been handled very well by her people. <laughs> right. And Scott Stevens is here. And Scott has written, I love this title, Adding Fire to the Fuel, Challenging Shame and the Stigma of Alcoholism. What a title. It's not, this is my third book. The first book, uh, What the Early Worm Gets, takes a look at the differences between treatment and mistreatment. When we're talking about alcoholism, I'm an alcoholic. The second book, is Every Silver Lining Has a Cloud. Again, a little play on words, and that book deals with relapse and recovery and the symptoms of sobriety. Um, again, I'm an alcoholic, I relapsed. I'm also a journalist, and I, in both of those books and my third book, Adding Fire to the Fuel, I take a look at the science, the evidence-based science, not the junk science or the observational studies, but the evidence-based science that's involved in recovery, involved in the disease of alcoholism, and in this case, looking at at the public perceptions, the public stigma of alcoholism. When we have 33 million people who have an alcohol use disorder in this country and only one in five are getting treatment for it, the reason behind that is the stigma that society has about uh, Scott can't handle his alcohol or Scott has a behavioral problem. No, I have a medical problem. But again, there's a, there's a certain stigma, I'm assuming, uh, attached to alcoholism and attached to white clay, 
Why they haven't taken this issue on head on is beyond me. But um, that's one of the things that I hope to be able to to um, begin is um, negotiating with uh, our people at uh, the Native American Rights Fund and hopefully uh, having them take this issue on. Uh, South Dakota governor has tried to stay out of the picture, and but we haven't really addressed him at all, so that's a good idea to, because South, South Dakota does have to pay some of the cost, you know, attributed to some of the damage that Nebraska's bringing onto its state. And Obama, you know, it's hard to get to him. You know, we would need somebody to uh, to, to get access to him or, or his uh, cabinet. Partly why I'm here is I watched Robin struggle. I, I cycled with him. Our last ride was a little over a week before he passed away. And um, he was, interesting that he mentions the watches here because he was becoming obsessed with time. We learned after he passed through the autopsy um, that he had a form of dementia and that time and space and time are an issue for people with Lewy body dementia. On our last ride, he kept turning to me saying, what time is it? And I kept saying, we always leave around 1, we always get back around 145, 150. I don't know, we're halfway through, I don't know, it's one third and So he was doing very odd and strange things on the last ride, and I immediately went from uh, uh, the ride where we would often go into his house and he would, you know, we would talk comedy or we would, um, you know, he liked to play the video games, as he mentioned, or Susan was often there, his lovely wife. She's an artist, she's a painter. And, uh, and that day he was just really, really down. But it was more than down, he was also off. It was something more than just depression. He was grappling with more things than he normally had. And uh, I just remember him saying, I'm just going to take a shower and chill out the rest of the day. And I said, what's up, man? We'll call you next week. I started comedy in jails and rehabs and prisons and shelters and places I used to live a lot in the 80s. Uh, that's a true story. So this is a gold mine for me right here. You chose to be here. That's a big deal. Uh, uh, okay, so the story, I, start, I do the comedy. And you know what I heard, Johnny? About 10 minutes in, I heard that laugh, that unmistakable. <laughs> you know that one? And I knew it was okay. So after the show, he comes in. That was a big deal right there. Because he had a, a, a laugh a little bit like Muhammad Ali. It's just, bam, bam, right? The, the second jab was worse than the first. You know, just the poof, right? And he had a laugh. And he was, he was clean, uh, you know, a whole 28 days. And they released him. So he says, uh, he says, hey, can I talk to you? I said, I, sure. I mean, intimidated is, is probably putting him mildly. And he had a sober escort, big tall guy, right? Ex-Marine, jarhead, probably just, you know, he, could, he had muscles in his eyes, this guy. <laughs> and Robin was a, 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 not a tall guy, not a, a big guy, but he was very powerful in his energy. And he said, uh, he said hey. I've never seen anybody do comedy about this stuff. My first thought was wrong. He's going to steal my stuff, right? Yeah. He had a <laughs> reputation for borrowing. But that's what actors do. That's what actors do. They borrow from real life to portray whatever it is that people in real life can watch that we can't do. <laughs>